So, how are we this morning? It's almost showtime. And there we go. And I'll cover up my face. Here we are. So it's a gorgeous morning. This isn't this morning. <laughs> um, this is probably Friday. Probably Friday afternoon, maybe Saturday. And uh, this is uh, Long Lake Provincial Park, but that's not actually Long Lake in the background. That's Withrod Lake, which is part of Long Lake. Um, that uh, part of the same park system. And uh, I say Dora the Explorer, that's a show or a book or a cartoon. I can't remember what it was. Uh, my kids had grown up by the time it came along. But anytime anybody hears Dora's name, they call her Dora the Explorer. Uh, I know there were nine people when I turned this on that were waiting. Not a very large turnout. Uh, but it's 8.30 in the morning. Um, uh, can you folks hear me and see me? Just want someone to say, ah, good, Christopher, great, thank you. <laughs> I always wonder, <laughs> am I just talking to myself? <laughs> it's a strange world here. Anyway, so um, I almost missed class this morning. That I, uh, Yesterday was really, really miserable with rain, so that's why I posted that picture for yesterday's class. Um, but this morning, I went down to uh, the shore. It's only a few blocks away from my house, down a steep hill, but um, uh, to get down to the northwest arm. And the sun was just magnificent, but and it was so bright, I couldn't take a picture looking down the arm towards the ocean. This is looking back the other way along that stretch. And uh, if you know Halifax, um, I'm looking across at Quinpool Road as it starts uh, from the roundabout and heading on uh, into the city. Uh, so it's a little bit noisy with the traffic early in the morning across the arm, but uh, still a few boats in the water. They're starting to haul them out now. Uh, many of the ones that are there right now are, uh, a couple of them anyway, are from boats from away. I'm not sure where they're going to go. We always get some that come here from St. Pierre Miquelon. We used to get some from the States. Um, but uh, beautiful fall colors, beautiful light this morning. But we were so enjoying things along the water's edge. Uh, I just wanted to hang around there for a while and then re remembered, oh, yeah, <laughs> we got class at 8.30. So raced on home <laughs> just in time. Um, this is the same. No. Uh, because you got a class on Tuesday and the other sections didn't get a class on Monday. What I did yesterday was pull out a little bit of what we did Tuesday, and I'm gonna recap that, recast it slightly, and uh, and then got into uh, some of the Excel stuff, uh, as well as trying to set us up about thinking about models again. Uh, some stuff from the very beginning of the course, because we are at a changeover period. This is the halfway point in the course, and we're flipping over from just exploring data to actually trying to analyze it and make some conclusions from it. And uh, I've been getting a number of people, um, as I said last time, if you weren't here on, uh, on Tuesday, uh, assignment one grades were much lower than they should be. It was a 65 average or thereabouts. Uh, that's way too low. It should be around 80%. And um, that, so I put out the offer, especially to those that got really awful grades and the assignments are worth a lot. So this is important. Um, if you redo questions, I'll give you back half the points. And so if you have been emailing me those and I'll try to get those grades fixed for them. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly looking at those people that may have gotten uh, five or six or three in some cases uh, on that out of 10. And that's, no, you should have gotten much better grades than that. So this will help bring it back up again. Um, if your problems went beyond that, uh, get in touch with me. 
I've got a couple of Zoom meetings with students to talk about the course. Um, and uh, so uh, 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 some find my office hours don't fit them. Uh, that uh, just send me an email and we can meet at a different time. Test number two grades, again, lower than I expected. I've gone through all the questions and found that particularly some of the ones on pivot tables, uh, there was there, those are challenging to do in a multiple choice test. Um, and maybe they don't really fit within that type of test environment. Um, so the, there were some questions where half the students were picking a different answer from the right one. Um, some where it was just everybody was picking a different answer. It was clear that they really didn't know which way to go. Um, so um, I'm going to be going through that over the next week, reviewing it again, and seeing how to adjust the scoring of the test. Um, to try to reflect some of that, that um, as well um, uh, within the test. And if you haven't viewed yours, you can view it now. Uh, and test one, you can view, learned how to turn that on. And I can add um, explanations to the answers. So not only would you view the results and what's the correct answer, but some commentary about why the answer should be C and not B. So it's, it's not just enough to know that you had the wrong answer, but why was the right answer the right answer? And why was my answer the wrong answer? So I'll try to put explanations in there uh, for, uh, and I'll go back to quiz one and, and do some stuff on that as well, in terms of filling stuff in now that I know how to do it. So I'm learning this as we go. I'm sorry that I didn't have it all figured out before the course started. Um, so, and as I said, that um, the, uh, we're making that transition from exploration, which actually is a certain amount of modeling, as so I'll get to, but, uh, and we're going to be using that data file we had last day, but I'm going to do the Excel part of it and uh, that as well. And uh, so the data set that we've got it's not a real data set, although it looks fairly realistic. A lot of it does, but some of it's rather strange. Uh, it was simulated. It's artificially created just for teaching purposes. And there are quite a few variables. There's the card balance that's owing, customer's income, the customer's credit rating, um, their credit limit, the customer's uh, so those sorts of things, um, the income is came from the credit card application, the rating would come from a rating agency, the limit would be set by the bank. Customer's age, not generally asked, uh, but it could be. Uh, years of education, that normally wouldn't be asked, not in Canada anyway, but uh, this came from the U.S., Number of credit cards held by the customer, that's a measure that you'd get from the credit rating agency, uh, that uh, you can get an awful lot of information out of the credit rating agency, all of the banks, financial institutions, pool their information, and then the agency spreads it back out again to the different institutions. And then there are four that are tricky ones um, that, they may be on the application, but they shouldn't be used generally in making decisions on issuing credit cards or setting the credit limit or uh, any of that type of thing. And those are the customer's gender, marital status, whether they're a student, that might be allowed. But gender definitely is not allowed and ethnicity isn't allowed. But those are in the data set. And later on, we'll use them. We're going to be using this for about, uh, three or four classes. And um, and as I said last time, suppose we want to study, uh, we're primarily interested in how much people borrow, and we have different reasons for looking at that. And we might want to build a model that we'll get to later, and it's, we'll have the next uh, two classes on is building a model to try to predict the credit card balance. And uh, we do that to get some baseline to measure what's unusual and what's typical. 
Uh, maybe we're essentially trying to build a profile for a customer. What should they look like? And so if things don't fit the profile, then that might signal uh, criminal activity or something going on, something strange. And uh, we might want to try to understand why they borrow as much as they do, or at least uh, how could we encourage them to borrow more so that we can make more money. And maybe we want to find those that borrow a lot because uh, we'll offer them maybe a home equity line of credit. We don't make as much money off that as a credit card. Uh, the interest rate's much lower, but we wait get them to then move their mortgage over with us and move other banking with us that they might be banking elsewhere and then move their retirement savings in with us and so on. And so get other business from them by being nice. <laughs> um, but we'd like to know what are the variables that give us insight into borrowing behavior and credit card balances. So uh, last time we grouped the data, put it into three groups and look to see how does it vary among the three groups. And we did that with a box and whisker chart. And so I'm gonna go and do all of these things at the same time in Excel. So this is my data set that I've got there, and I've recoded using VLOOKUP to put them into risk groups. And here's all my other data that I've got there. And just to remember, how do you do a box and whisker chart? I haven't made you do this in the assignment, I don't think. Um, I'll take the balance. Generally, I don't bother with the label. I just take the data. And with a number of charts, when I'm just building charts, I'll often not include the label because Excel doesn't know is there a label there or not. It's not like with some of the other things where we tell it that my data has labels. When you're making charts, it doesn't know. So I'll go over here to insert. I'll go to charts. They're none of the ones I want. So I go down here to box and whisker. We click OK, and we got that simple chart. And then I wanted to put the risk group in here. So I go back to select data, and I go to edit here, the horizontal axis, and it wants the label range. So I to grab these, don't grab the title, just all the different values and I click OK and well you can always already see my graph in the background and there's my chart and so this is the chart we had last time and it showed us a pattern that as um, people with lower risk borrow more and this is where most of them are is where the boxes are and the whiskers say well but they're scattered around the middle so I've got a lot concentrated here, but a lot of scatter above and below. And so let me go back here. And then we said, well, could I make, oh, with the other class, I asked them, put in the discussion question about that box and whisker, which one they like better, what you told me during the chat. And there was, like um, we had in class, there was quite a split between the two. I got to take a break. I can hear Dora chewing something. She chewed a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> I don't think she likes me teaching. She wants the attention. So choose during class this week. So yesterday she chewed up several cardboard boxes that we had with stuff to put in storage. <laughs> and the day before it was uh, a variety of toys that we were giving to Value Village. They were, she took them back to her crate and they were all little pieces. Um, today she's chewing up the book that I'm reading at the moment. <sighs> oh well.
we discuss which chart that we like better of these two. That do we like the scatter chart? Do we like this box and whisker chart? And just to reiterate what happens is when my sample size gets larger and larger, the boxes for big samples stay roughly the same and the whiskers stay roughly the same. What you get with big samples is outliers um, at, at the ends here. But otherwise, the basic pattern stays the same. With a scatter chart, as you get more observations, you get more and more density in the middle. So it gets thicker and thicker blue to reflect these dense areas in the middle. But also the outside pieces where I've got whiskers here, and I know these are less dense, they get so full as well because there's so many dots that I can't tell between the concentrated stuff and the whisker stuff. And then I get outliers too. Uh, so they, uh, scatter charts sometimes can be a problem if I've got a huge, huge amount of data. If it's a modest amount, modest, here's 400, that's modest, uh, maybe up to 1,000. A scatter chart um, is definitely the more popular method. We're going to use scatter charts for the next several classes uh, to look at different patterns. But you've got, uh, watch it, with when you've got too much data, I would revert to the box and whisker for sure. Um, I like the box and whisker. I just find it very simple, tidy, um, but it's a matter of preference. There's no right answer. And uh, if I was showing it to an audience, I would give them the scatter chart because they don't understand the box and whisker. So, and we looked at patterns across other variables and I've got one here that I forgot to fix. I realized, it says here age, age going from zero to 400. No, uh, this is the observation number. Uh, this is the wrong chart. I'll show you the right one again later. Um, but this one is, is the wrong chart for age. Um, and we saw that in a couple of the charts, there seems to be a very, very strong pattern. This one looks somewhat weaker. And these ones, I don't see anything happening there at all. And when we've got many variables, sometimes we may have 50, 100, several hundred different variables we could look at because we've got so much data that we're pulling about uh, what people are doing. And this is uh, the stuff that we're getting maybe off the web or it's, it's information we've accumulated on them. Uh, if you had a medical database where these are patients and these are patient outcomes, and all kinds of different treatments and activities and age and number of days or number of this, that. The amount of data that accumulates in medical databases is just astronomical. Um, but it, it can give you uh, incredible insights about what might be going on. Um, and But we're, we've now got the capacity to collect all this and start analyzing it. But, uh, and if you think, oh, medicine, that's outside the highest cost in the public sector is health. And if you were an accountant or you're someone looking at operations, how to minimize costs, making our healthcare system work more efficiently is a huge, huge area, a big opportunity. And it's become a, a, a massive area for data mining. Um, it's going to become a, a huge area from a management perspective. There'll probably be a lot of pushback on that between the healthcare people, the doctors, and the accountants. But it's it's going to be a growing area. Uh, many of you may end up graduating and working in um, management or financial responsibilities within the healthcare sector. But it's a big one for data mining. So um, how do we get the scatter charts in Excel? I just, oops, I didn't do that for you go back and do that. So that was the way I did the box and whisker. To do just a simple scatter chart, you take the two columns you want. So I want, and be careful how you do it, take the ratings. Don't take the label. Sometimes it works with the label there. I think I showed you last class doing it with the label, and it worked. Um, and then the next class I did it with, it didn't work. So 
I don't touch the label. I just take the numbers. I grab them all because again, I'm not, I don't have a checkbox to say that my columns have labels. So Excel can easily get confused. Um, times it doesn't seem very smart. And I go up, I insert, I say, give me a chart. It picks the right one. It's a scatter chart. And I click OK. So there's my scatter chart, especially with these ones here where I've got numbers on each axis and i've got a thing here i strongly recommend let me move this up to the top here that you go in the design tab go over to add chart element format it right away because you're going to forget things i know you're younger and have better memory than me but uh we forget quickly so on the horizontal this one was reading add in there on the go back and the vertical axis so axis titles and i want vertical and this one i'm going to call it balance and that's in there i don't like reading up and down you may be happy with that it's common in charts to see that but what i would do is i'd right click i go to format axis there are different things up here uh this one here seems to be the one to use says text direction you find these things just by exploring it's hard to find good instruction and there balance it's horizontal i find it easier to read um, it's up to you and title give it a title and most of the time if there's a story in the picture that you want to tell people put the story in the picture so um that um Customers with good ratings or oh, more. There we go. That's what the pattern is. And so when I'm saying that if they got good ratings, they seem to borrow more. And then you look down and you see the picture and that's exactly what's there. So it's, it's, they reinforce each other. Don't just say balance, credit card balance versus credit rating. Why should I look at this picture? Uh, the title doesn't encourage me, uh, doesn't motivate me. It's not a call to action. And when I look down, I have to think about it and I have to come up with the interpretation of it. Don't make me work. Uh, and if you're trying to sell your conclusion to them, um, sell it to them. So back I go to our slides. So I just went, built my slide, and put all those things in it. Okay. And last time, we said, well, if you're doing this lots of times, and suppose I've got 50 variables, 100 variables, I've got lots to choose from, and I'm trying to sift through them and see which ones have a strong pattern, which ones have a weak. If I had to go and build pictures for every one of them, that's an awful lot of work and very time-consuming. And then I've got to make judgments about which one is better than which. Where should I focus my attention? So it's nice if we have a number to measure how strong a relationship there is there. And uh, that sometimes numbers that we use are abstract. We can't really picture them. We sort of saw that with standard deviation, that uh, standard deviation is 100. What does that mean? Uh, if it's 200, what does that mean? If one group has a standard deviation of 200 and one has a standard deviation of 100, I know that one is more diverse than the other. Standard deviation is a measure of diversity. But the number itself doesn't mean much, very much to me, unless I can associate it with something. And uh, we have experience associating numbers with pictures or feelings or um, an emotional reaction to it. And uh, um, each morning I take Dora out and we check the temperature at tide first. You know, and that, okay, it said this morning, I think it was eight degrees or something like that. Okay, I know how to dress for eight degrees. Uh, if they'd said it was 18 degrees, oh, okay, don't need a sweater on you this morning, Dora. 
Um, but eight degrees and less, we'll put two sweaters on you. That uh, if it said it was minus eight degrees, that um, we have to go out. You know, it, we make a judgment because we associate the number with how comfortable we'd be going outdoors with certain types of clothing. Um, so it's not that the number itself has a special, we can picture what does eight degrees look like. I can't see it. I feel it, but I know what it, the, the different temperatures, how they match with the numbers. Same thing with correlations. Look at the pictures and in your head, you should have a picture for each of these ones. And so here's um, ones where there isn't a pattern and R is very, very close to zero in these two. And then these ones had some pattern that the one on the left is a very, very strong pattern, 0.86, and the other one is not a very strong pattern, it's 0.46. That some of you might not even think there's much, any sort of pattern at 0.46. If my correlation was 0.3, you probably wouldn't see much of anything at all. Um, you don't see a strong image. The picture doesn't be, get sharp until R gets up around 0.7. And then it gets then tighter and tighter into a narrower and narrower band that you can see the pattern. But, um, uh, but many people would think, oh, well, R 0.5 is a very strong relationship. Mm, it's not all that. Well, it's useful. It is giving you information, but it's not as strong as you might have thought. Uh, so it, it, they, they vary a fair bit. Um, and of course, it's only a linear relationship. So as mentioned last day, these two guys are curved. And that if it's a, if it was an upward sloping curve, if it was a curve that was zip, like a ski hill, um, then we'd still get a positive relationship because you could draw a line going uphill. But if you drew a line through these ones, the line would be flat, it would be horizontal. And that would suggest no relationship. So an R close to zero means there's no straight line relationship, but it could be that there's still a relationship there that's curved. Um, so you don't automatically dismiss an R that's close to zero, uh, especially if you thought you should have seen something. If you thought there should have been a pattern and the R said there wasn't, then I'd go and do a scatter plot and see what's, what's it look like there. So as to how they're calculated, in Excel, it's really annoying. Excel wants the two columns to be side by side, adjacent, um, that nothing in between them. That if you look at our data set, let me get my pictures out of the way. And I'll just, hello, I'm just gonna take them out all together. Whoops, get you out of the way. Huh, doesn't want to remove that picture. There we go. Okay. Let me go up and look at what my variables are here. So I've got ID. It's a number, but it's not a numeric variable. Uh, that was one of the problems in the test, social insurance number. Is it numeric? Is it a quantitative variable or, or a categorical or qualitative variable? It's a categorical. These are just happen to be different people, but I gave them numbers, but they're just people. They're not, they aren't numbers. Um, that, and so this may be coded numerically, but it's a categorical variable. So I really shouldn't analyze it, though we could. And I accidentally threw it into my correlation table, you'll see in a minute. Income is numeric, it's quantitative limit is, rating is, this one isn't. So I'm not gonna be able to use that one in a defined correlation. Cards, age, education, those are fine, but gender doesn't work. Student, married, ethnicity, none of those work. Those are all clearly categorical. And then, but balance is numeric. So remember, correlation involves looking at differences from the mean of, it's a messier formula than variance, but it's all measuring how far you are from the middle. So it has to be numeric. 
So if I ask for correlation between rating and balance, it won't give it to me because it's got all of this junk in the middle. It's going to want a block of data, not column, separate columns. So what I did was I went and copied the numeric ones into a new sheet. Okay. And whoops. And I just copied it like that. Okay. Um, that'll work much better when we're trying to find correlation. We're going to find when we get into our next topic of regression. We're going to do the same thing. When we want to do something, we're going to copy what we need into a new sheet, and then we'll do our analysis because these data analysis tools uh, are very limited in their what they can do, and they want the data formatted a certain way. So I copied these in. To then find correlation, I can do all the correlations I want all at once. I go up to data. I go over here to data analysis. It's in this list. We've done histogram before. We did descriptive statistics before. Now we're using correlation. And I click OK. Now it's going to ask, where is my data? Just like the other ones did. What's the input range? My data, I can include ID. I shouldn't have, but I, I did. And it goes from A1, the top left corner, all the way down to the bottom right corner. So that's column H, and it's row 401. So this is where my data is. I've put my data in columns. We almost always put our data in columns. I've got labels in the first row. So this is not like building charts where I just grab the data I want. This one, I tell it where the data is, and I can tell it it has labels. Uh, when I'm inserting a chart, I can't tell it it has labels. So um, I'll just leave that out there. Go check. For the output, um, um, when I'm doing some of these ones, uh, I've been with a lot of things before. I've been putting my output in a new sheet not in my data sheet. This one, I'm doing a specific task. I just want correlation. That's all I'm going to do on this sheet is correlation. And so here's the data that I want to do the correlation on. And then I'd like the correlations to be right there with the data. So I put, tend to put them in the same sheet. But you can always put it in a new worksheet. Um, but this way, I know the correlations I got had to do with the data that's over here. And if I was doing other types of things as well, I can uh, keep it all together if I have to. And so I even labeled this tab correlation so that I wouldn't lose it. And so I'm going to put it up in J1, which is up in this top corner up here. And you see there's already stuff there. That was from yesterday. And I'll just put it right on top. And it complains, hey, there's stuff already there. So what? Put it on top. Boom. And there it is. It gets put on top of the stuff I had before. And it creates a table for me. All right. At the, um, in this table, you will see a variety of numbers. There's on the top part, it's all blank. I'll explain that in a minute. The diagonal just has one all the way down. And that's because I'm looking at the correlation between credit rating, this one here, between rating and rating. Rating and rating, it's if the rating was 462, the rating is 462. These guys all match up on a perfect line uh, because it's the same thing twice. There's no variability, no scatter, anything like that. So the diagonal always has ones. Then the other figures. Well, we had um, rating and we looked at balance. So here's balance. Look at this row here. Okay? And rating and balance, I said the correlation was 0.86. And with income, it was 0.46. So just looking at those charts, um, this was rating and balance. This was the 0.86 one. And this one was 0.46. Okay. And then we had um, 
with the number of cards, we had a correlation of 0 0.086, and that was this guy, 0 0.086. So it's almost zero. And we had it with um, uh, education, was it? No. Oh, we had it with age as 0 0.002, but I, I've got the wrong picture here. When I have this one here with age, that's not the right picture, but this one is um, correlation should be around zero. Uh, and then, so I can look at with balance, uh, ID shouldn't matter which in the list of one to 400 the different customers are. Um, so yeah, the correlation is effectively zero. With the credit limit, uh, it's got almost the same correlation as the credit rating, limit rating. And if we looked at the charts, we had this happening here. Oops, there we go. There, there was the one with rating, and this was the one with credit limit. And they were both looked the same. There was very little to distinguish between them. And you'll see that their correlations are almost the same. Um, 0 0.086, or 0 0.861, 0.863. So there's nothing really to distinguish between the two. With age, it's it's next to nothing. With education, it's negative, um, but it's almost zero. And you can look at some of the others, like um, if I look at income and rating, that it looks like people with higher incomes have better credit. They have there's a positive, fairly high correlation between the two. You might think, well, um, which way is the relationship going? How should I read this? This is rating and income. Is that the same as income and rating? Yes. This, whatever the number, if I put a number in here, it would actually be the same as that one. If I was looking at uh, balance and income, it would be the same as this one balance and income. If I know it one way, I know it the other way. Correlation doesn't care. Is it, does A cause B or B cause A? It's saying is A, are A and B related? How strong are they correlated to each other? But they're not saying who came first. So if I know the bottom half of the table, I know the top half of the table. And so generally with most software that produces correlation tables, um, it only gives you the bottom half because this is it's just redundant, it's useless. And so we've got lots of numbers that are very small. Um, I've got age and income. Older people tend to earn more. Okay, I can believe that. But the correlation is still very, very weak. It's 0 0.0175, it's, um, uh, or 0 0.175, excuse me. Uh, so it's not a very strong correlation, but they are related to each other. Look at this one here, 0.99688. You can't get a higher correlation than that. That's almost a perfect one. And let me just go back to my, whoops, my data. If I was to take limit and rating, this is the ones that had this crazy correlation. And I go and insert a chart. Look at that scatter chart. That is as close as you're ever going to get to a perfect straight line. There's no twist to it. There's that little tiny bit of scatter above and below, but that's almost a perfect straight line. That uh, very, very rare occurrence. This is when I saw this, uh, something's wrong with this data. And we'll talk about it later when we start building models. But it's very, uh, first time I saw it, I've, I've never seen a correlation that, that high. Quite shocking. But I understand the story behind it now. So um, this correlation table is very useful from an exploratory perspective at us trying to figure out which variables should we focus on and which one should we not. Um, where do we think there are patterns? Where do we not think there are patterns? You're doing an assignment right now where you're, you're using pivot tables 
and you're looking for patterns. Um, and you're looking at patterns between the class of uh, 2019 and, and this class as to what changes took place and are they, is there a pattern, a relationship here that might be explained by uh, the effects of COVID on all kinds of different things, direct or indirect uh, consequences of this virus. Um, but you're looking directly at the pattern, like looking at a scatter chart or, or a box and whisker chart. And um, you're not measuring it with a number like we are here. And, uh, but it's, it's comparable in terms of uh, a, a useful tool to look to see where are their patterns and where aren't their patterns. So let me get back to my slides. I think that's all I want to get done in Excel today. So we went and we did all of these different tasks here and we got it. So uh, we're going to move from here to actually try to figure out how do we use the information that's here. At the moment, I'm using the quantitative variables, but I want to predict credit card balance. We also have qualitative variables, categorical ones, gender and marital status and those sorts of things. And we'll see how to use them as well in building a model to give us predictions of the credit card balance. And then we can use that model to give us an idea of why do people borrow more or less? Can we identify certain drivers behind that? Um, can we predict how much a particular customer will borrow? So if I've got a new credit, uh, 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 they come along and someone has just applied for a credit card and I've gotten data from them and from the credit rating agency. And I'm going to think, is this going to be a customer that I'm going to make lots of money from because they're going to borrow a lot? Um, or are they one that uh, is probably, they got a card, but they're not going to use it. And uh, it's, uh, thank goodness I'm charging them a, an annual fee to own the card because they're not making money by, by using their card. What type of customer is this one going to be? And uh, I may also use it to give me ideas of, of what other types of cross-selling I can do with them. Can I promote products or services or that type of thing to them? So when I talk of a model, what do I mean? Um, if you did Quant 1 at St. Mary's, uh, you did saw several models. You saw uh, a model for break-even analysis or you saw several models. So a model for revenue, a model for cost, a model for profit. And when you did finance, you had models for uh, relating how much you're borrowing and what interest rates in the term to what the biweekly payment was gonna be on that loan. That uh, models that related certain factors to an outcome, it's a formula. Uh, and you even saw ones in linear programming where the model actually wasn't one formula, but a whole set of equations or constraints, inequalities, that sort of thing, that described one of them describing an objective, what your goal was, and uh, a whole bunch of things that had to do with what were the things that were constraining you, limiting you from making as much money as you'd like or keeping the costs as low as you'd like. So a model, we represent it all mathematically. And there is a huge range of different models that are of that nature. But uh, we can also have models that are physical, you know, a scale model of something, a, a scale model of a building so that I can do tests to do with how winds will circulate around the building or a, a, a mock-up of what a car is going to be so I can do wind tunnel tests and how the winds are going to affect the handling of the vehicle before I even build one. Uh, so they're physical ones. Some are just to, so I can see it. If I had blueprints of a house, that's a model. It's a description of the house. Um, and uh, so it helps me visualize what's it going to look like. Some of our models are just verbal. We're talking about relationships between things. I'll show one in a minute to do with, with customers or the life cycle of a customer. That's a model. Um, and that I'm just going to show it with pictures, but pictures and words. Uh, there are all kinds of different ones. 
and but they're none of them are exact they're very simplistic crude representations of things um, that uh, trying to show you just as much detail as you really need like a box and whisker chart is sort of like a model it shows you a minimal amount but it it helps you understand what's taking place there so they don't incorporate everything but they uh, should accurately show the features that are most important to you and most of our models at least we're going to start out mathematically but others are going to be fuzzier than that not quite like in that fashion so among models we have descriptive models and then we've got predictive models and when you did linear programming you were doing prescriptive models models that told you what to do how many units to make um, descriptive ones just tell us what's happening uh, a predictive says if this if, uh, for this customer i expect them to do this be their behavior i'm going to predict what's going to happen um, but they're not perfect so uh, descriptive models a profiling model um, in a sense what you're doing in your assignment is building a profile of the 2019 student what they look like and you're building a profile of the 2020 student and what do they look like and you're comparing the two uh, so maybe i'm going to build profile of the perfect customer and then say how can i find more that look like the perfect customer that so that would be a profiling type descriptive situation co-occurrence ones those are the simple um, those who bought this also bought this you know that they, these two things tend to go together clustering is trying to put them into groups in a descriptive sort of fashion and uh, I just remembered yesterday uh, a case of clustering that a firm did for me uh, over 10 years ago it was a firm that um, had them survey all the applicants to St. Mary's and they'd also done surveys of applicants to other universities and many of the questions were ones about what they liked what they didn't like, how they made decisions, um, a whole variety of personality type factors. And then they found that the applicants generally to a university fit into four boxes. There were four types of applicants. So we're not looking at gender, we're not looking at where they're from, we're not looking at their program those sorts of things. We're looking at the characteristics of the individual. And they classified them into these four groups. There was one group they called enthusiasts. These were students that they were going to university to get a career, to get a job. Uh, it's gonna, uh, they're very focused on personal, professional development, uh, very highly motivated uh, to build for their future. And then there was another group, again, highly motivated, but they were internally motivated. It wasn't because they wanted a certain job or money or that type of thing. Uh, it just, they enjoyed it. They were internally motivated. They, they studied history because they liked history. It was, uh, they really got into it. They were excited about it. And they tend to be um, ones that might be a little more environmentally conscious, uh, they were a little more thoughtful about other people, that type of thing. They, they had broad interests. They were called, they, they, the label they put on this group were humanists. Um, but they were, again, a very attractive group of students. If, if you were looking for students in your class, you wanted highly motivated students. Whether that motivation came from inside or came from outside, they were motivated. They, and uh, so they would be potentially exciting students to have in your class. Then we had other groups. <laughs> there were the conformists. The conformists were ones that, why are you studying business at St. Mary's? Uh, well, my parents wanted me to do this. And so that's what I'm doing. Yep. Um, that uh, th th they're being driven by conforming to social norms. Um, this is what everybody does at my school. Uh, this is what my parents want me to do. This is what all my friends are doing, so I'm going to do what they do. Um, that 
So they aren't motivated to do this. They're just going along with the pack, or being pushed along. And then um, the last group were called drifters. And they were ones like, I don't know, high school's over. I don't want to go work at McDonald's or Tim Hortons. So what do you do? Uh, you know, uh, well, why are you studying business? Well, I don't know. I didn't want to do science and arts. I don't know. I'm probably not going to get a job. So I don't know. I'll take business then. Um, they're just drifting around. And so a, a university, now you may think they would all want to just recruit the enthusiasts or humanists. Depends upon the mission of the school. Um, I really am interested in the drifters. If you get the drifters coming in, and there's a large population of drifters out there, that they need guidance. Um, they need someone to find the switch that turns them on. And if an institution can develop programs and can engage the students, they can turn someone from a drifter and transform them into an enthusiast or a humanist or something. But they've got to find the switch to turn them on. Um, an institution that does that adds a lot of value. The enthusiasts and humanists, they're going to be successful regardless of what the university does. Uh, so I'm not sure if they add a lot of value. So if you're someone that focuses on value add, uh, the humanists and conformists actually are, are, are a rich group to go and, and focus on. But those, I'm giving a long story here, but this is a clustering application. And if we can identify different clusters, then you can see what services and how you structure around that. But it's purely descriptive. I'm making no predictions. Um, so that in forming the clusters, the people within a cluster are similar. So what do we mean by similarity matching? There's a whole bunch of different applications where we're interested in things like similarity matching. Um, if I could build a profile of different of what a good Tim Hortons location would be and what a bad Tim Hortons location would be, then I'm going to go and do similarity matching between a, a variety of potential locations and the ideal Tim Hortons location for when trying to pick a spot to do it. And causal modeling, I'm trying to figure out what are the levers for change? What causes things to happen? All of these ones are unsupervised learning. So I'm, I don't have an outcome in mind. I'm just trying to describe what's happening. There are an awful lot of those applications where it's important to us to do that. Prediction isn't, it gets all of the hype, but it's uh, uh, a lot of what we do is on the descriptive end. And a lot of the tools that we've used so far are very good for doing the descriptive stuff. You're not getting into fancy math. Uh, the predictive ones, value estimation and classification are the biggest ones by far. We call these supervised learning because we are directing the learning that takes place by trying to guide it towards a specific outcome, a specific target that we've got. And we collect different types of data. We collect data on how much they borrowed as well as characteristics on the customer. So I can use the customer information to help me predict how much they're going to borrow. And we talk about training the model because I'm going to take this historical data and I'm going to try to find a matchup between customer information and borrowing so that I can make good predictions. And then what works on my old data, now I'm going to go and try to apply on new data. Uh, so there's certain language that we tend to use in these two things. And we'll be looking at initially at value estimation, and we're going to be looking at building models that are strictly a formula. Um, put numbers in, I get numbers out, like a cost formula. The types of things you may have seen in 1205, where there's a whole bunch of inputs um, in a formula and an output to that formula. And we're going to try building it then in that fashion. Um, that, but when we get into classification models, introduce you to a variety of other types of ways of thinking about how you do classification that isn't exactly a formula at all. Uh, you can be very creative in how you do these things. And some of the methods we'll use in classification could actually apply to value estimation. So um, just a quick question. Whoops, I lost a slide. Where did it go? Here. Hmm, I've got them out of order. Excuse me. 
um, just to finish off today, I want you to think about this because this is um, your business program is all about making good decisions. Good decisions usually are based upon evidence, on 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 knowledge, and evidence usually comes from data. So if I'm going backwards, then it means well, what data should I get? How should I use it, and how can I use it to make better decisions? Uh, and a lot of people don't think about how many different decisions there are out there to do. And um, I'm presenting a lot of you are at the beginning of your program. Some of you are uh, well advanced in your program. Um, so trying to find applications that you can relate to. I've been using student applications. Uh, marketing, we're customers for everything. So we have a sense of marketing, at least from the customer's perspective. That... Uh, here's a simple model of a life cycle of a customer. A customer starts out as a prospect that you, the firm then sends an advertisement to or direct mail solicitation or radio ad or something like that. And the, some of the prospects respond to them. And uh, so they go into the store because they heard it's, you know, that they visit the website because they heard it's Prime Day, whatever. And some of them buy. So from prospects to responders, I got a smaller group. From responders to new customers, it's a smaller group again. And that uh, in many instances, that first-time customer becomes a repeat customer. And we start building a relationship. And sometimes that relationship breaks down. I decide this is a customer I don't want anymore. They're not paying their bills, and so I'm going to cancel their credit card. That, um, or customers decide, I don't like you anymore. I don't like your service. I don't like your prices. I'm going to shop somewhere else. And they become a former customer. Sometimes you can bring back former customers and, and make them established customers again. So there's a, a cycle to it. That, uh, and different phases and different types of decisions at each phase. And there's this acquisition phase, there's the activation, converting that responder into a new customer, and then the relationship management that you do with established ones. So there's lots of decisions to be made about each of these. I want you to think about the acquisition one. What are um, questions, what are decisions, actions that you take in getting prospects or um, trying to get them to respond, those types of things that you're doing at the very beginning, trying to get them to become a customer. Um, and that uh, getting you to think about the data you'd have, but the first thing is, is what is it that you want to do? Then we'll figure out how do you do it. Um, and a lot of these ones, most of them, are data mining applications if you can get the data. So. Um, the, uh, so what decisions do you want to make? Um, and this is from yesterday's classes. And I'm curious as to what, uh, what your thoughts are on their, um, uh, what do they need? Um, how can I fulfill them? That you're talking, you're get, jumping the gun in a sense. You're, who are these people that you're talking about, about these customers? And you're asking about what their needs are. So let's go all the way back to define who are the prospects. And you, you need to start there. You've got a set of products and services you're probably already delivering. And there may be ways that you can... Uh, help engage that new customer or that established customer. But, uh, and these are very important questions that we need to address there in trying to de define what our product offerings are and how we deliver service and that type of thing. I want to get back before they ever got in the store. What makes a good customer? That is the perfect question. Is, is um, that the, now, Learn what predictors show who will fall in this category. Um, you are trying to find who's a good customer. I'm not sure with your 
other statement, Christopher, is to um, how do you find them? Because <laughs> that's an important thing. You could describe the ideal customer. I might describe an ideal student, but how do I get them? That's another question. So there's, there's two things here. Um, who are you targeting? That's where you start. And um, very often people screw up because they haven't thought carefully enough about who the target is. And um, I know with programs at the university that uh, departments, you know, are all hyped up about their new program. And I ask them, who's going to take it? Oh, lots of people. Who? Where are they? Describe that person to me. And when they describe them, it's just like, how do you reach them? And then there's deathly silence because they don't know how. And without getting them, they're never going to get their program off the ground. But that's where you start is who are you targeting? Sometimes you start out by identifying who you want to target as a prospect, and then you develop the product. Uh, we have a master of finance program that I was involved in developing 20 some years ago. And it was an agent came to me about students from China that he wanted to bring here. I said, all they want to study is finance. They wanted a master's degree. They want to become financial analysts. Um, and he had a market, a target. Um, it was then defining what would be the product they'd really want to buy and at what price. Uh, but that's a different sort. But it's the target demographic. Um, so that... Let me jump ahead in my slides then, because we're going to run late again. That get that profile. So there's a profiling exercise that may come from if I've got historical data. That if the customer I want are people that borrow a lot, then I've got data on the customers that borrow a lot. Can I build a profile of what they look like? How old are they? Oh, it's a male, age 35 to 50. Uh, it's someone that earns over $70,000 a year. It's someone that, da, 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 and a whole bunch of characteristics. And so that becomes my ideal that I'd like to target as a prospect. And now if I'm going out looking for prospects, um, I won't just look at those ones because there are other people as well, but then maybe that's my ideal. Um, I get questions about, well, is this a good prospect or how good is this prospect? It's not the ideal one, uh, but it's a pretty good one. It's it's a female. She's 42 years old, earns $120,000 a year. Not a male, but it's in the right sort of age range and very high income. Is that a good prospect? So one's a profiling thing. Another one then is going to be a measurement thing. It's similarity matching. How similar is this one to my ideal? So that's another data mining application in terms of that. Um, what you guys didn't raise, but it's the, the next phase is in of responding. Respond to what? A radio ad? Uh, an ad you posted on a website? What website? Who visits that website? Is that the right channel for that prospect? That uh, So... Um, Picking the website that you've placed ads on, that's a channel you're using. So I need to find what is the best channel. And I've got, I've done advertising before, so I can go back and look at my historical data. And of my good prospects, what were the best channels for the really good prospects? Uh, not just people that did respond. Maybe lots of the people that responded really weren't good ones for me. So they weren't, good, they didn't translate into good customers. So I'll mine my data and find which channels um, attracted the most good customers. Uh, but it depends upon how you use the channel. What sort of ad did you place there? Another choice we've got to make. And how do we fashion that ad? And I've, we've talked before, or I've said to, and, and you did it in your uh, answers on test one, about experiments, these A-B experiments, these the way they'll run ads online and try to tweak their message so that it gets a better response from you. So, you know, I, I'm i just barely starting and I've already got several big questions that I can 
uh, with the messaging, maybe I'm going to make an experiment to help me do that. So I don't have the data yet, but I have an idea of how to collect data to help me make the right decision. So there's a whole bunch of these sorts of things. And um, I could go on further about like, well, what's the chance a particular respondent will participate? You know, it's, it's going to become a customer. Um, that what do I expect as a return out of this sort of customer? Here's a customer that's just come in uh, and has just gotten a credit card. Uh, how much can I hope to make on an annual basis from this type of customer versus another type of customer? And that's a value estimation problem. So you can see of the different applications, it isn't just one that um, I can define a business problem. I need more customers as being my business problem. But when I drill down into it, I end up with a lot of smaller questions. And in your assignment, I've tried to do that in terms of just trying to do a descriptive thing of how students have changed from last year to this year. Um, changed in what regard? In terms of their finances, in terms of their stress, in terms of their demographic profile, uh, the, the mix that I'm getting. And there I can drill deeper in, in assignment two. You're, you're now in assignment one, you are just getting the data ready for analysis. In assignment two, you're actually doing descriptive analysis on that group and trying to answer specific questions. And it, it was very much sort of more profiling type of exercise. Um, that, um, and a lot of what we've done before have been descriptive models. We're moving now into uh, predictive models. We're gonna look at value estimation using formulas. And once I've got a formula, then I know, um, like a simple formula, like a cost formula. Cost is fixed cost plus variable cost. And the coefficient to X in that formula is the unit variable cost, how much it costs per additional unit. Um, so that formula helps explain to me, why are my costs so high? Oh, it's because you've got a big fixed cost or because the unit cost for each unit is quite high and you're producing a lot of units. So I can explain how costs are, are the cause and effect aspect of it by looking at the terms in my formula. That So if I can build a formula, I can do causal analysis. So I, I can do these sorts of things. But uh, as I said, in classification, um, that they can take on other things. They can be decision rules. If this happens, I'll do this. If this happens, I'll do that. Um, uh, it, it doesn't look like a formula. It, it looks like a bunch of rules. A large number of them, uh, especially in classification, involve issues of similarity. And uh, that we will try talking about that in the context of classification. But similarity is a very, uh, it's an easy concept to understand, like diversity. Okay, I understand what that is, but measuring it, that's a different thing. How do you measure similarity? When someone says that you look like your father or you look like your sister, what does that mean? Uh, did they actually measure how similar you are to your sister? I don't know. Um, but we do it. We say this. Um, that um, how do you measure it? Because we're going to need to get into measurement. and We're a quantitative methods course. Okay, um, That becomes a challenging issue, and we'll talk about those. So there are a lot of issues that are going to come up in future that um, uh, – the first part, though, is going to be relatively straightforward. It's how to build a formula. And then we'll look at other things that come after that. So the next class, I'm going to be looking at, it's called simple linear regression. It's how to fit a straight line. We're going to work with straight lines primarily. So if I go back here and look at this chart here, I could draw a straight line through the scatter. What straight line? I could draw a variety of different lines. What's the best line to put through that scatter? What do you mean by the best line? Um, that uh, if I draw a line through it, just like a cost function, it's got slope and intercept. What does the slope mean? What does the intercept mean? What do the coefficients mean? Uh, you should be able to interpret that because if you're going to do causal modeling, you've got to be able to interpret the numbers you get. If I were to use this straight line, the uh, 
none of the dots fall on the line, or there's a handful of them that do, or they're very close, but some are above and some are below. So if I was using it to make a prediction about a customer, new customer, credit rating is 800, how much do you think they're going to borrow? Oh, I think they're going to borrow about $1,500 on average. Yeah, but would they borrow more or less? Yeah, maybe less, maybe more. How much more? How much less? Can you actually tell me that sort of thing? It's, can you predict really accurately? Like here, I think I can make somewhat accurate predictions, but if I was using income for my model, and this is someone that earns $150,000 a year, it seems to be a huge amount of scatter here. I can't make accurate predictions. What do you mean by accurate? Let's try to define what these different words mean for us. So there's a variety of these different things of what accuracy mean. We'll be introducing a term called R squared. We'll be revisiting standard error. You're going to get sick of me talking about standard error, but it's a valuable tool in talking about accuracy and in trying to make predictions. So this is a host of different things that we're going to then hit on in our next couple of classes. We're going to do this starting with a very simple model with just uh, one x variable. And then we're going to add more variables in. It's called multiple regression. So the next three classes are going to all be about this regression analysis. And uh, it's, as I said, linear. So we're going to look at straight lines. But we will address issues like, what do you do if it's curved? What do you do if I'm trying to put gender into my model? Um, that's, that's not, it's a categorical variable. How do I do that? Can I put it into a formula as well? And if you did quant one, uh, you might remember binary variables at the end, which was, uh, basically categorical variables that we put into formulas in that course. So there's a quite a broad range of different things that are coming at us next. Uh, all of the math will be done by Excel. So it will do the calculations. Uh, and we'll still use graphs and pictures uh, to help us make decisions about how we'll build this sort of model. Um, I hope it's fun. Uh, I enjoy doing this next phase of things. Uh, that's where we end today. Uh, if you've got questions about assignment two, uh, send me emails. Um, I sent out an email yesterday, hopefully clarifying a few points on it, but I'm still getting some questions coming in. Uh, and if you're running into problems with it, uh, I recommend you actually send me your spreadsheet. Uh, and many have done that. Um, screenshot, some of them I've had trouble viewing. They're, they were just too small to be able to see what was there. Uh, and I don't know what was in behind. But send me the spreadsheet is the easiest way of fixing it. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend. You take care and uh, enjoy your day. Bye now. Mm-hmm.